But I mean, if we if we were to run through it, there's some problems with the Big Bang. Yeah. Um, one of the first problems is you can't get from gas to solid objects like dust. Right. The Big Bang starts, and you have um, you have initially a whole bunch of energy, and then they say uh, some hydro, uh, mostly hydrogen, perhaps some helium as well. An expanding cloud of gas will not reverse its expansion and collapse into solid objects. Right. Um, how do you get grains of sand from gas? gas not inside a container. I don't know where these two guys got the idea that solid objects can only form in an expanding gas if the gas stops expanding and collapses directly into the solid state. I mean, have they never heard of cumulus clouds? Cumulus clouds form when a bubble of air at the Earth's surface is heated to a higher temperature than its surroundings. Because it is warmer than its surroundings, it is less dense than the air around it and begins to rise. As it rises, the bubble expands, its temperature drops, and once the temperature drops below the dew point, some of the water vapor condenses into liquid water droplets. If the air bubble rises high enough, its temperature will drop below the freezing point of water and some of the water will condense into solid ice crystals. So here we have an example of solid objects forming in an expanding gas that is not confined to a container and without the gas ever having to stop expanding and start collapsing. This is similar to the way that the first dust grains formed after the Big Bang. Dust grains, by the way, are ubiquitous in astronomy. They are tiny pieces of solid material that are spread throughout the space between the stars. They are made of elements that can be in the solid state at the low pressures that exist in interstellar space. These include carbon, oxygen, iron, silicon, magnesium, aluminum, titanium, etc. They range in size from a few angstroms to a micrometer. Dust grains could not form immediately after the Big Bang because the only elements that the Big Bang produced, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, can only exist in the gas phase at the low densities in space. The heavy elements that are needed to make dust grains would first have to be made by fusion inside the first generation of stars. Recall that the creationists in the video clip claim that gas expanding in the aftermath of the Big Bang can't stop expanding and collapse because it's not confined to a container. While solid objects like dust grains do not form like this, stars do. Star formation actually requires that an extended low density cloud of gas directly collapses into a compact, high-density star. So if the creationists are right that expanding gas produced by the Big Bang cannot stop expanding and start contracting, then stars could not form after the Big Bang, and thus the heavy elements needed to make dust grains would never be made. Fortunately, the creationists are wrong. The matter produced by the Big Bang was initially very uniformly distributed throughout space but the distribution was not perfectly uniform, and the density of matter in some regions was slightly higher than the density in other regions. Gravity caused regions that had a higher density than average to expand slower than the regions that had a lower density than average. Thus, while the density in an overdense region decreased as the universe expanded, it decreased at a slower rate than the mean density of the universe decreased. Therefore, the density in an overdense region relative to the mean density increase with time. And when the density of a region reached 2.69 times the mean density of the universe, it stopped expanding and underwent gravitational collapse. Computer simulations show that a star, or perhaps a few stars, will form at the center of the collapsing overdense region. These stars were born between 100 million and 200 million years after the Big Bang. Initially, these stars were composed entirely of hydrogen, helium, and lithium, since those were the only elements around. Now, a star is a ball of gas in hydrostatic equilibrium. Hydrostatic equilibrium means that at every point in the star, the force due to gravity, which points towards the center of the star, exactly balances the force due to pressure, which points directly away from the center of the star. The pressure comes from the random thermal motions of the gas atoms and is thus proportional to the temperature of the gas. For there to be a net pressure force to balance gravity, the pressure must be highest at the center and decrease towards the surface. For the pressure to be highest at the center, the temperature has to be highest at the center, and this requires a source of thermal energy at the center of the star. 
The source of thermal energy that keeps the center of a star hot is, of course, nuclear fusion. To see how fusion acts as an energy source, consider the most basic fusion reaction in which hydrogen fuses into helium. A helium-4 nucleus has less mass than the mass of four protons. So if you could somehow force four protons together into a helium-4 nucleus, the total mass of your system would decrease. According to special relativity, the mass of a system carries an energy equal to the mass times the speed of light squared, you know, E equals mc squared, so the helium-4 nucleus has less energy than four protons. Since energy is conserved, that difference in energy has to go somewhere, and as it turns out, it is converted into heat. Thus, fusing four hydrogen atoms into one helium atom releases heat, since the helium-4 atom has less mass than four hydrogen atoms. It should be noted that in a star, four hydrogen atoms don't simultaneously collide into one helium atom. Instead, helium is slowly built out of the four hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen fusion is but the first stage in the nucleosynthesis of stars. Once all of the matter in the core has been turned to helium, the helium fuses into carbon and oxygen. Then the carbon fuses into oxygen, neon, and magnesium. And the neon fuses into magnesium and oxygen. Then the oxygen fuses into silicon. And finally, the silicon fuses into iron. At this point in a star's life, its composition has an onion-like layered structure. At the center is an iron core, and the core is surrounded by a layer of silicon, which is surrounded by a layer of oxygen, which is surrounded by a layer of neon, which is surrounded by a layer of carbon, which is surrounded by a layer of helium, which is surrounded by the hydrogen envelope of the star. Recall that fusion generated heat, because when you force two light nuclei together to make a heavier nucleus, the heavier nucleus has a lower mass than the sum of the masses of the lighter nuclei, and thus the mass difference is converted to thermal energy in order to conserve energy. However, once we reach iron, we can't generate any more heat by fusion because iron nuclei have the lowest mass per neutron and proton of any element. Any nuclei that you make by fusing iron nuclei will have a greater mass than the sum of the masses of the iron nuclei, and thus fusion would absorb heat instead of releasing it. So the iron core does not have a source of heat to act as a source of pressure to maintain hydrostatic equilibrium. At some point, the iron core will gravitationally collapse into a neutron star or black hole. The energy generated by this collapse will send a shock wave through the star, causing the outer layers of the star to be ejected into space in an event that we see as a supernova. The inner part of the star, which includes a lot of the heaviest elements made, falls onto the newly formed neutron star or black hole but the heavy elements that happen to be far enough away from the center to be ejected into space will mix with the surrounding primordial gas and eventually become incorporated into a new generation of stars. The part of the star that is ejected into space is called the supernova ejecta. Because of the shock wave that propagated through the ejecta, its initial temperature is incredibly high, and all elements in the ejecta are in the gas phase. But as the ejecta expands, its temperature drops, and eventually the temperature drops enough so that some of the heavy elements will begin to condense into dust grains. This is similar to water vapor condensing into liquid water when the temperature drops below the dew point. The dew point is defined to be the temperature at which you would have to cool air in order for some of the water vapor to start condensing into liquid water. For the most part, the dew point only depends on the amount of water vapor in the air. Higher amounts of water vapor correspond to higher dew points, because the more water vapor there is in the air, the higher the temperature has to be to keep it all in gas form. Water, of course, is not the only substance that can change from a gas to a liquid or solid when the temperature decreases enough. If you cooled air to a low enough temperature, eventually the oxygen and nitrogen would start condensing, and then maybe other substances would start condensing out. The same principle applies to the atoms of a given element in an expanding supernova ejecta. Consider carbon atoms as a concrete example. At first, the temperature of the gas will be so high that all of the carbon atoms will be in the gas phase. But there is some critical temperature that is to carbon what dew point is to water. 
such that when the temperature drops below this critical temperature, some of the carbon atoms will condense into solid carbon dust grains. This should be no more mysterious than water vapor turning into liquid water when the temperature drops below the dew point. Each type of dust grain has its own critical temperature at which it condenses from the gas phase, and thus different kinds of dust grains will form at different times after a supernova explosion. Let me summarize the main points of this video. The two spokesmen of Creation Ministries International claim that if the Big Bang actually happened, then there would be no dust grains today. They come to this conclusion because they think that gas collapses directly into dust grains and they think that gas expanding with the universe after the Big Bang can't stop expanding and start collapsing because it's not in a container. Both of these ideas are just silly. Gravity acts like a container and eventually reverses the expansion of gas that happens to be in a region where the density is higher than the average density of the universe. Stars form at the center of these collapsing regions where they cook the primordial hydrogen and helium into the elements from carbon to iron. When these stars explode in supernovae, the inner part of the star collapses into a neutron star or black hole, and the outer part is heated to some ridiculously high temperature and ejected into space. The heavy elements made during the lives and deaths of these stars that don't get trapped in the neutron star or black hole are part of the ejected matter that the star is essentially giving back to the universe. At first, all atoms are in the gas phase because the temperature is just so high. But as the supernova ejecta expands and cools, one by one, dust grains of different types begin to condense out of the gas phase. The formation of dust grains, therefore, is no more mysterious than the formation of water droplets and of clouds in the sky, and certainly no more miraculous.